The previous video was an algorithm for instantiating that covering an object with balls of radius epsilon business. And the basic algorithm involved putting a grid over the object that you're trying to calculate the dimension of, and then building some computer data structure that keeps track of each of those boxes, and then walking through the trajectory point by point, looking to see which box each point lands in, and then doing whatever you need to do with your data structure to keep track of how many of those boxes got ticked off. That's the n of epsilon in the capacity dimension calculation. Then to carry out the rest of that calculation, you need to let the box size get small. And you do that by reducing the size of the grid and repeating the calculation. Now in practice, you can't let epsilon go to zero without running out of memory, of course. But what you'll see when you do this calculation over a range of epsilons is a shape that looks like this. And we've discussed what these things mean. We've also discussed the fact that if, if there is a scaling region in the curve, then its slope is the capacity dimension. But this gets to be a pretty expensive computation. There are other definitions of fractal dimension that sidestep some of that expense. And one of them is the correlation dimension. And that's the topic of this video. I'll give you the basic idea, and then Joshua will give you the algorithm for calculating this. You start by defining something called the pointwise dimension. Imagine that you're trying to calculate the dimension of this set of points. You pick one of those points, and then you draw a ball of radius epsilon centered on that point. And then you count the number of points, and then you count the number of points in that ball around the point x. And the idea is that that is a measure of how often a trajectory typically visits an epsilon neighborhood of x. And that makes sense if we're trying to think about a fractal dimension. As you may have anticipated, the next step is to vary epsilon. If you do that, make the ball bigger, it's going to have more points in it. Make the ball smaller, going to have fewer points in it. So you're going to get a similar scaling law. The weird little box in there is because I had made an error and done one over that. My apologies. And this exponent in that scaling law is called the pointwise dimension. Now, it's pretty obvious that depending on where you pick that point x, dp is going to vary. If you pick the red point in a very dense part of the attractor, it'll be different than if you pick that point in a very sparse point on the attractor. The obvious next thing to do is to average n sub x of epsilon over lots of points x. And if you do that, you get something called c of epsilon, which also typically scales as a power law. And the exponent in that power law is the correlation dimension. Now, why is this useful? You can actually control the effort that you put into this calculation and the quality of the results by varying, for example, the number of x's that you pick to do the average that goes into c of epsilon. One last thought exercise before we move to the calculations with Joshua. What inequality do you think lives in here? It's actually a less than or equal to, and if you think about it, at best, the correlation dimension could capture every point if you do a ton of averages, but it might not. Now let's shift here slightly and talk about a different measure of fractal dimension known as the correlation dimension, which is very fast to calculate for an experimental time series. The box counting dimension we just learned about measured how much space was filled up by a particular object using boxes of an arbitrary size epsilon and seeing how the relationship between epsilon and the number of boxes needed to cover that object changed as epsilon got smaller and smaller. Correlation dimension is slightly different. Instead of measuring how the relationship between boxes and box size changes, it measures how tightly clustered the points are in your set. It does this through the relationship of how many points are within epsilon of each other and epsilon, and then lets epsilon get smaller and smaller. This is a very nice measure of how tightly clustered points are on an object. In general, this can be measured for any point in any set, as long as you can define distance, or as long as you can tell whether points are within an epsilon ball of each other. However, for the purposes of this course, we'll be thinking about points as points in the trajectory of a dynamical system. And then we'll measure how tightly clustered the points in this trajectory are by using something called the correlation sum and its relationship to epsilon. For experts, technically it does this with the correlation integral, but a typical finite approximation of the correlation integral is the correlation sum. We will use this as this is the standard. This method for approximating the correlation dimension is known as the Grassberger and Procaccia algorithm. Let's take this formula one step at a time. 
these two points, xi and xj, are simply two points in the set that you're trying to calculate the fractal dimension of. For example, these could be points in the trajectory of the Lorenz equation, or they could be points in the trajectory of the Hanan map. These could even be points from the trajectory of a reconstructed dynamical system using delay court embedding. These are simply two points in a set that you're trying to calculate the fractal dimension of. The interior part of the summation is called a heavy side step function. A heavy side step function is one if the interior is positive and zero if the interior is less than or equal to zero. In this case, it is measuring whether the distance between, that is the double bar notation, the points xi and xj are strictly less than epsilon. That is, if xi, or respectively xj, are within an epsilon ball of each other, then this quantity is one. If xi and xj are not within an epsilon ball of each other, this quantity is zero. This double sum notation simply means to repeat this calculation for each pair xi, xj, and then to add up all the resulting ones. This gives us a way of measuring the probability of whether two arbitrary points are within epsilon of each other. And that's precisely what the correlation sum measures. The probability of whether two arbitrarily chosen points in the set are within an epsilon ball of each other. This gives us a very nice measure of how tightly clustered points are in a set. It turns out that the correlation sum follows the following power law. That is, the correlation sum is proportional to epsilon to the correlation dimension. This means, as we saw with the box counting dimension, if we plot log of the correlation sum versus log of epsilon, the slope of a line in any scaling region that appears in this plot is an approximation of the correlation dimension. And this is precisely what is done in practice. If you took the time in the last unit to install Tissian on your own computer, then the D2 command will do all of these calculations for you. If you use this D2 command on a reconstructed time series measured from the Rossler equation, you get a plot that looks like this. The slope of the scaling region is 2.1 plus or minus 0.05. Sure enough, if you check what the correlation dimension is for the Rossler tractor, it is in fact 2.1.